Boy oh boy, cartoons sure are great. But what if we took one good cartoon and its characters and we push it somewhere else? Today I'm going to be going over my top seven cartoon crossovers. Why seven? Eh, I'll go over that in the 100th episode along with like a bunch of facts or whatever. Before we get started, I gotta get a couple things straight first. What qualifies a good crossover? Seamless animation blending. Characters maintaining their personalities and traits despite being in another property's world. If you don't know too much about the shows crossing over, you feel you want to afterwards. And if you do know about them going in, you're rewarded for it. What's a jalopy? With that said, let's begin. Is this a crossover episode? Dad's gonna sell my organs if he finds out I ripped his lucky pants! There's only one group of kids who can help me now. Hello! Ed, Ed, Nettie's pesky problem fixers! Got a problem that's pesky? We'll fix her for just one lousy quarter. What do you mean you're broke? Hey, if you're looking for charity, call Kids Next Door. They're cheap. Grim Adventures of the Kids Next Door is like watching your friend from school meet your weird friend from camp and realizing that they complement each other pretty well. I mean, sure, one's dark, moody, and somewhat juvenile sense of humor might come off as absurd and grating to some people, while the other's childlike sense of wonder combined with their tendency to take themselves much more seriously might make them seem immature and unwilling to grow up. It sure is a lot of fun watching them butt heads and learn to work together. This 22 minute long special is the product of two show creators, Maxwell Adams and Mr. Warburton, being given the chance to do something special. And with the two being fans of each other's work, the fun and the passion behind it really shows with the jokes, crazy ass stories, and some of the best dids of both shows' formulas. Mandy New Dictator Manned Robot. Monkeys and nice doggies relax on bellies of turtles. What kind of acronym is that? Well, if you weren't in such a rush, maybe I could have come up with a better one. What dastardly deed are we doing now? Simple, my dear General. We are going to block out the sun. Whoa. Oh, yes. I have plotted for weeks and figured that if we build a huge wooden shade 80 feet high and 50 feet wide, precisely on this hill, South Park will forever be cast in a great shadow. Oh, awesome. Soon, all people will have to live like moles. They will live only to remember with sorrow how great the sun used to be. <laughs> cool, it'll be just like on The Simpsons. Huh? They did that on The Simpsons. I think it was the Mr. Burns character. He tried to block Springfield from the sun. He did? Oh, heck, I thought I was being original. The Simpsons is an absolute juggernaut in the animation industry. Being the longest running animated show comes with a slew of guest stars, very special episodes, and of course, its own share of crossovers. <laughs> All right, you guys are my new best friends. You wish, loser. Never mind, <laughs> someone like you. While the crossovers range from being okay to pretty good, I gotta give it to this couch gag from the season 26 finale. Oh, oh my God, Morty, what did you do? You killed oh the Simpsons, God. Morty. No, no. Oh, oh, no, oh God, God, look at the baby no, one. Oh, my God, Morty. I love Rick and Morty, but this little piece of guest animation couldn't have come at a better time for both shows. The Simpsons needed that little push to get some of the 18 to 25 demo back, while Rick and Morty was premiering its second season that year. The Simpsons helped introduce the show to the masses, of which a good chunk probably didn't even know about its existence. It knew how to poke fun at itself, and it sure was a delight to see Roy and Harmon's morbid sense of humor on primetime television. In terms of the other Simpsons crossovers, I really liked Simpsorama. I mean, I'm a sucker for Bender and he really shined throughout the whole thing. Even though the story felt to which, I mean, it was more a Futurama episode anyway. And at the time, even Futurama was shelling out episodes that were decent at best. Also, what the hell, wasn't it confirmed that The Simpsons was a show in Futurama's universe that had merch and everything? Why is it that Futurama now takes place in The Simpsons universe's future? Why isn't Fry yellow? These are questions I ask myself. And Simpsons Guy definitely had its moments too. Oh my god, that was great! It also had moments I'd rather forget about.
Oh, yeah, and the credit crossed over one time, and Matt Groening hated it. Goodbye, Mr. Sherman. If I ever play Carnegie Hall, I'll give you a call. And if you ever want to visit my show... Nah, we're not going to be doing that. Oh! Jeez, man, how do we show all these old Disney cartoons to kids without making it feel like we're just recycling our animation library? <laughs> Why did House of Mouse work as well as it did? Well, for starters, they actually did produce new animation to tie in the old cartoons by having Mickey and his pals running a club that showed the old tunes to literally every Disney animated character under the sun. I remember being so excited to see the antics with the crazy cast of Disney characters each episode, while simultaneously learning to appreciate all the older tunes that came with it. Some of the Flash animated Mickey Mouse tunes were okay at best. This was before Mickey had his complete character revamp that made him way more entertaining to watch. But I'm always a sucker for Donald and Goofy stuff. All in all, this was a great concept for a show and a genius move by the Disney executives. Wish they could keep going today, considering the insane popularity and resurgence of Disney princesses and nostalgia for Disney's renaissance. We're remaking, remaking Mulan. They uh, did, they're doing Lion King with Beyonce and Childish Gambino. Uh, they, they're, they're doing all sorts of stuff. So they should, should do that. As a kid growing up in Ontario, Canada, my parents had satellite TV for a hot minute in the early 2000s. And with that, I was able to watch Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, and the Disney Channel in all of its glory. I'm talking Hey Arnold, Ed, Ed, and Eddie, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, Kids Next Door, Dud, The Other Dud, all that good stuff. All together, only on direct TV. So you can really channel your family's interest. Anyway, we went back to basic Canadian cable like a year later, and I got stuck with Teletoon, YTV, and Family Channel. While the switchback might have been jarring, I wouldn't have had it any other way, actually. It was through this loss that I discovered shows like The Bugs Bunny and Tweety Show, Tom and Jerry Kids, Wacky Races, and a whole slew of Canadian cartoons. More on that in another video. But more importantly, I discovered everything Hanna-Barbera had to offer. I still remember catching Yogi's Christmas as a kid and being like, Oh shit, I just watched the other Yogi Bear movie the other week, and now there's a Christmas special with all these other funny characters in it. Eight-year-old me wound up taking to the internet to search up on Snagglepuss, Huckleberry Hound, Doggy Daddy, Oddy Doggy, Quick Draw Madraw, etc. Did you just mispronounce etc? And don't even get me started on Jetsons Meet the Flintstones. Mainly because I fell asleep when I tried to watch it initially, because I didn't really grow to appreciate those two shows until later on in life. But for real, Hanna-Barbera truly were the kings of throwing a bunch of their properties at a wall to see what sticks. I mean, just look at all the friggin' Scooby-Doo crossovers there are. Scooby-Doo meets Batman, Scooby-Doo meets the Addams Family, Scooby-Doo meets Johnny Bravo, Scooby-Doo meets Kiss, Scooby-Doo meets... Oh, shit! Scooby-Doo meets Batman again. Scooby-Doo meets the Harlem friggin' Globetrotters. Scooby-Doo meets Jesus. Scooby-Doo meets Steven Universe. Scooby-Doo meets Birdman. Scooby-Doo meets the Laws of Physics. Scooby-Doo meets Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Poo, scooby scooby Noobers, M. Night Scoobalon. Why won't you die? Anyway, yeah, I'll probably just give this spot to the Johnny Bravo episode. That one was pretty funny. Don't worry, I don't bite. Does she? Oh. They ask you how you are, and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they... Now, does it count if you've got a dream scenario in one show that renders the crossover more of an homage to a different show? For the sake of my argument, and because it's my list and not yours, I'm gonna say yes because it's Samurai Quack. Little backstory here. Samurai Jack is widely appreciated and hailed as one of the best modern animated shows of all time. Everything from its beautiful visuals to its ability to tell amazing action-packed stories filled with deep messages and dark undertones while keeping dialogue to an absolute minimum has confirmed that it'll be remembered fondly forever. Duck Dodgers was also pretty good. Oh, no you don't. We're on opposite sides. The show, along with Fresh Prince, introduced me to Tom Jones. It's not unusual you want to be loved by anyone. Also, it was in my opinion one of the better attempts at a modern Looney Tunes show. 
with Joe Elasti being a major selling point as Daffy's voice actor. At the risk of making myself look absolutely ridiculous, may I ask you who is your favorite cartoon character? Mm. Homer Simpson. Put some respect on my name. I absolutely loved his work as Buds and Daffy in 2003's Looney Tunes Back in Action. What would Duck Dodgers do? Wait a minute. I am Duck Dodgers. Yes, I'm going to be the hero of this picture. Duck Dodgers to the rescue. All right, so what the hell do these two shows have to do with each other? Well, to make a long story short, Daffy eats bad shrimp, has a trippy dream, and wakes up fine afterwards. <laughs> While that might not really sound all that great, it's the beauty of the dream that makes this episode. They actually emulated Samurai Jack's animation very well, and while the humor is all duck dodgers, the visuals did not take a bat seat, complete with dids at Samurai Jack's lawn walk sequences, widescreen fight scenes, and even the fact that he couldn't actually kill a human on screen at the time. Not a robot! You're lucky I didn't cut you to ribbons. Not with a Y7 rating, you won't. Something that they corrected in Season 5. Damn! Also, having Mako in the episode as a cat version of Aku was hilarious. Wait! What are you doing? Cheap counterfeit Manolo Blahnik. All in all, I can look past the whole it was all a dream trope because they really did it justice here. Samurai Quack is an awesome send up to Samurai Jack and one of the best episodes of Duck Dodgers there is. <laughs> Alright folks, by no means is this special the be all end all of crossovers. But gosh darn it, did it ever set the bar high for anything to follow. The Jimmy Timmy Power Hour is, in my opinion, the standard of which crossovers should go by. At least from an animation perspective. The two shows, Fairly Odd Parents and Jimmy Neutron, were both good in their own right. But visually, were vastly different from one another, making this special a surprise to most cartoon fans. Wow. A chance to see traditional animation clash with computer animation in the coolest of ways. Finally got to see what Bucktooth Barnes would look like in 3D. Nightmares aside. And we got to see good old chocolate swirl as flat as this note. <laughs> Swapping art styles should be a staple for animated crossovers, but it seems we still haven't gotten to see that implemented as effectively and as fun as the Jimmy Timmy special. Whoa! Hey, why is everything so bulgy? Hey, who cares? My hands! My arms! My dip! It's gone! In terms of how I myself viewed the special, I liked it. I was always a bigger fan of Fairly Odd Parents than Jimbo's No Tronbo, but I did love the movie, and the show had its own handful of fun episodes, too. Um, yes. Are you going to finish that croissant? The Fairly Odd humor worked really well with Jimmy acting as the straight man, but Timmy's antics in Neutron Land were... Uh... They were alright. You Neutron is still the best. Breakfast! Time to come down! Down, 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 down! Quack! Down, 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 down! Quack, quack! And now, our number one. First, here's a bunch of stuff that didn't make the list, for a bunch of reasons I probably won't list. All right, you got a you got a good look. Cool. Nineteen eighty eights. Who framed Roger Rabbit? Come on, you guys. How could I possibly resist? The love child of director Robert Zemeckis and the most talented crew of producers, animators, writers, best boys, Spielberg, Scary K. Wolves, Alan Silvestri's. <sighs> Roger Rabbit was animation hybrid gold. All of you millennials who love Space Jam and rock the merchandise and say it was so amazing need to sit back and realize that not only did Roger Rabbit do it first, he did it better. Reason number one, there's actually a story. 
Roger Rabbit wasn't just a showcase for beautiful animation mixing with live action, but I mean, it definitely did thrive in that field. It also was an action fantasy period piece with a side of murder mystery. Other than the plot, you had some really great chemistry between very, very professional live action actors like Bob Hoskins and Christopher Lloyd, with all sorts of beloved animated icons as well as some new ones created just for the film. Never before or after have we seen animation fused so beautifully with live action, due in part to how crazy the crew got just picking apart each scene and going the extra mile to nail the authenticity of having real people interact with cartoons that had to be added in afterwards. Every object, every movement, the shadows and lighting, it truly is the product of an immeasurable amount of creativity, hard work, and what I'll assume was a very long copyright process because every damn character is in this. You got Donald, Goofy, Daffy, Dumbo, Porky, Tweety, Pluto, Minnie, Huey, Dewey, Louie, Woody, Betty, and of course, Mick Moss. And that wastily old rabbit, Roger. A timeless classic and one of my all-time favorite movies, Who Framed Roger Rabbit definitely deserves the number one spot. So that's my list. If you didn't see what you wanted to see here, make your own list. Then send it to me on Twitter or something so I can tell you how much better yours was. Make sure you support all of the SoundCloud artists. Uh, their music is amazing. I was Malcintosh on PC. I probably still will be the next time you see me. There is a high chance that I will still be the same person. Cluck, cluck, yeah, cluck, 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 yeah. Ooh, caribou.